In this video, we will continue the conversation about nematodes and specifically focus on the four tissue nematodes. So these are the four pathogens we're going to be talking about. Toxocara canis, Onchocercovolvulus, Loa Loa, and Wucheria bancrofti. So let's just go through these one at a time. Again, when it comes to nematodes, you heard me say it in the last video that I published, I want to simplify everything into buzzwords, associations, risk factors, and then throw in mnemonics where appropriate to help you identify this on test day. Because after all, on tests, I'm going to guess that most of your brain space is going to be occupied by bacteria and viruses. And so when it comes to other types of pathogens, such as the nematodes, we really, really want to simplify this, make it as easy as possible so that you don't need to spend hours learning this material. So let's start with Toxocara canis. Toxocara canis has the word canis in the name because the canid animals like dogs, cats, etc., are the ones that get infected. Now there's fecal oral transmission here and humans are the intermediate host. Risk factors are going to include tropical and subtropical climates. And something that I want you to think about are community sandboxes. So because your canine animals are the ones that are going to be infected, they have a tendency to interact with soil or perhaps poop on the dirt or the soil and in and around sandboxes. And so those who are more likely to get this infection are children because children are more likely to come in contact with infected soil or in this case, infected sandboxes. So I haven't really seen this mentioned elsewhere, but if you see sandbox in the vignette, you really wanna think about Toxocara canis. Now the two big symptoms for Toxocara canis infection are one, are one, blindness, and two, meningoencephalitis. This can be further subdivided into different disease processes, which I'll explain in just a second here. But big picture, visual problems, and central nervous system problems equals toxocara canis. So now let's talk specifically now. The first disease process you want to be on the lookout for is ocular larva migraines. And so what happens here? is that the pathogen migrates through the posterior eye and that causes unilateral vision loss. That's why it's called ocular larva migraines because the larva migraines or migrates through the posterior eye causing ocular symptoms. So the name tells you exactly what's going on. Likewise, you can have visceral larva migraines because your larva is migrating or migrating through the viscera. So when it does that, it can cause infections in various hollow or solid organs. The big one to keep an eye open for on your test is hepatosplenomegaly because of involvement of the liver or the spleen, but this is not just limited to the liver or the spleen. You can also see involvement of the heart and other viscera. So visceral larva migraines, the word larva migraines means that the larvae migrates, and then the first word tells you where it's migrating to. So again, on your exam, if they give you ocular larva migraines, look for ocular symptoms. If they give you visceral larva migraines, look for visceral symptoms. So let's just keep this simple. Lastly, if the infection becomes really, really severe and spreads to the brain, you get central nervous system involvement. And the big thing to be on the lookout for here is meningoencephalitis, but you can also get secondary neuropsychiatric symptoms and seizures. Treatment for Toxocara canis is bendazoles. So Toxocara canis, again, has canis in the name. Canis because it infects canid or canine animals, dogs, cats, etc. And so really what you need to take away from this is that the two big clinical symptoms that they'll give you in the question if they want to test you on Toxocara canis is blindness and central nervous system involvement. And so my mnemonic here is that canids use their eyes and brains to hunt. Eyes for ocular larva migraines or blindness and brains for CNS involvement or meningoencephalitis. So if you think about a fox, for example, using its eyes and its brains to hunt at night or to hunt, find its food, whatever, it really relies on its vision and its brain in order to hunt. And it's a canid. Canid 
helps you remember Toxocara canis. So that's all I need you to know for Toxocara canis. Again, I'm trying to simplify this because you don't need to waste a ton of brain space here. Remember blindness, meningoencephalitis, and remember sandboxes. That's Toxocara canis. Now we'll talk about Anchocerca volvulus. This is also known as African river blindness. The reason that this is known as African river blindness is because the black fly is the vector. Now the black fly or simu, simulium damnosum, which is very difficult to pronounce, that fly tends to live around rivers. And what happens here is that that fly relies on oxygen-rich, fast-flowing bodies of water, like rivers, like rivers in Africa. And so what we tend to see is that because there is a disproportionate number of black flies around high-flowing, oxygen-rich rivers in Africa, people who live around those rivers tend to make up the pockets of high infectivity. And so if I were to put up a map and show you, which I'm not going to do, but let's just say if I had a map and I highlighted in red areas of the map where there was a disproportionate number of onchocercovolvulus infections, what you would see is that around rivers, there would be a lot of color on the map. Now, onchocercovolvulus gets injected into the human host during the L4 larval stage of growth. And after that, it takes approximately one year to fully mature into an adult worm, which is known as a microfilariae. Now, you don't need to understand the stages of larval growth, but just so you hear it from me in case you see it elsewhere or see it on an exam, when the larvae are growing, they progress through stages of growth, and those stages are numbered L1, then L2, then L3, etc. And so here, it's injected during that L4 larval stage of growth. And before the L4 larval stage, the pathogen is essentially growing within the black fly through stages L1 through L3. Now it takes approximately one year to mature. And then once it matures and it's in the human host, it starts to manifest symptoms. The key symptoms to keep in the back of your mind for onchocercovolvulus are blindness and dermatitis. And so what's happening here is that there is an immune reaction to the adult worms, or there's an immune reaction to the microfilariae. And specifically, this occurs in the eye and in the dermis. So we see visual symptoms and we see skin symptoms. The pathophysiology here is that ICAM1 becomes modified and there is a increased expression of pro-inflammatory interleukins, IL1 and IL4. So what we see here is that from the visual perspective, you're going to have recurrent conjunctivitis, punctate keratitis, photophobia, and progressive visual loss. So the infection makes its way into the eye because the adult worm is in the eye. There's that immune reaction and that causes visual symptoms. From the skin perspective, you get something called leopard skin. So this is marked by puritis, papular dermatitis, lichenified dermatitis, and skin depigmentation. So eye symptoms and skin symptoms because the microfilariae are in the eye and the dermis, and it's not the adult worm itself causing the symptoms, it's the body's immune response to the adult worms that causes the symptoms. And again, the ones to look for are blindness and dermatitis. And so visual loss, and skin changes. Treatment is going to be ivermectin. Now, the way that I think about this is ancho circa sounds like ancho circus, and I think about the circus. And specifically, I think about people performing in the circus who are the blind man and the skin guy. And I know this might sound out there, but every circus has a blind man, and every circus has that skin guy that has really stretchy skin that can pull his skin and it kind of looks like a fish in a, one way or another. So I think the Ancho Circus blind man and skin guy. And what this helps me remember is that blind man, there's going to be visual loss and blindness and visual changes. And the stretchy skin guy in the circus helps me remember that there's going to be skin changes, dermatitis, etc. So Ancho Circus, your circus performer is the blind man and the skin guy. That's it. 
Now let's talk about Loa Loa. This is also known as the African eye worm, and you'll understand on the next slide why it's called the African eye worm. The vectors for Loa Loa are your deer fly and your mango fly. The key symptoms, this is really the big part of what they test you on on USMLE and Comlex, is you, you have to remember that Loa Loa causes painful vision, but no vision loss, and dermatological manifestations. So if you're sitting there thinking, wait a minute, you're telling me stuff in the eye and stuff in the skin, how am I supposed to differentiate Loa Loa from Onchocercovolvulus? Hang on, because almost 100% of the time they're going to give you a picture on your exam. Now, the changes that you have to look for, the clinical symptoms, you're going to have angioedema, puritis, urticaria, and painful vision without vision loss. And that last part kind of differentiates it from onchocerca because you're not going to get blindness. There's no visual loss. It's just pain in the eye. So the angioedema is because the loa loa worm migrates through human subcutaneous tissue. As it does that, if you can imagine a worm moving through the subcutaneous tissue, what might happen in response to that? Well, you'd get swelling, you'd get angioedema, you'd get itching, you'd get pruritus, you'd get urticaria. And then when that worm makes its way to the eye, it causes pain with vision or painful vision. And that's because it's in the subconjunctival tissue. The treatment for Loa Loa is diethyl carbamazine. Now, I want you to relax because like I said, you're probably sitting there starting to worry a little bit, like all of these different uh, nematodes are in the eye. How do I keep this straight? If the exam writer wants you to pick Loa Loa, they're likely going to give you a picture. Loa Loa in the eye looks like this. You literally see it in the eye, and that's why it causes painful vision, because the worm is in the subconjunctival tissue, and it moves around in the eye. Because of that, there's sort of like a space-occupying lesion, although in this case it's a worm, in the eye. So it's going to be painful, it's going to feel full, and you're literally going to see it if you inspect the eye. So if you see a picture like this on your exam, the answer is Loa Loa. You cannot get this confused with Onchocercovolvulus because although that does have visual symptoms, those visual symptoms are due to an immune reaction to the microfilariae. Whereas in Loa Loa, literally the worm is in your eye, and that is the cause of the symptoms. So the way that you can memorize this is that Loa and I each have three letters. So if you're sitting there on your exam and you're like, okay, I have a picture, I see a worm in the eye, I has three letters, which nematode has three letters? Loa. The answer is Loa Loa, and you're done. So that's all you need to memorize. That's it. Let's conclude by talking about Wuchereria bancrofti. This is my favorite name because it sounds wild. So Wuchereria bancrofti is spread by mosquitoes. And interestingly, this is the second leading cause of infectious disability worldwide. And you'll understand why that is in just a moment. Adult filarial worms reside in the lymphatics, the afferent, the efferent, and the hilar lymphatics. And so the symptoms that you're going to see clinically are going to have to do with problems with lymphatic drainage and flow. So the big one is lymphatic filariasis. And what you can see within that spectrum of disease is one, lymphedema, because we have lymphangiectasia, blockage, and inflammation, which is triggered by those dying worms in the lymphatics. So they reside in the lymphatics and then they die. They block the lymphatic ducts and they cause lymphangiectasia. And so collectively, these things are going to cause lymph edema. Additionally, you can have the presence of something called adenolymphangitis, which is a very fancy way of saying fever and painful lymph adenopathy. And then the most severe manifestation of a Wucheria bancrofti infection is elephantitis. Elephantitis is the name that's given to very severe swelling, usually of the limbs, although not always, associated with hyperpigmentation and hyperkeratosis. And I'm going to show you an image of what this looks like. You'll never forget it once you see it. And the treatment here is diethyl carbamazine. So here's a picture 
of elephantitis. Again, what you're seeing here in this image is the most severe manifestation of the disease where you have really horrible, severe swelling of the limbs with hyperpigmentation and hyperkeratosis. Excuse me for going back and forth on the slide. The way that I remember this is Wucheria bancrofti sounds like bank, right? Bank crofty. It's a bank. And that makes me think of a piggy bank. But in this case, the piggy bank is actually an elephant piggy bank. So your elephant piggy bank, elephantiasis associated with bank crofty. That's it. Four nematodes, not a lot that you need to know, but each of them have a very distinct and a very high yield clinical manifestation. Don't waste a lot of brain space here because again, these are not as high yield as your bacteria and your viruses, but you absolutely need to get these free points on test day if they test you on it. So for that reason, I would encourage you to rewatch this video if you need to.